Welcome to our virtual town hall presentation on the draft climate change policy 2023 to 2040. My name is Lisa Hurlston McKenzie, and I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Environment and Resiliency with the Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency. During this presentation, you will hear from Carrie Forbes, Meteorological Forecaster at the National Weather Service, Simon Boxhall, Communications, Public Awareness and Training Officer at Hazard Management Cayman Islands, Loren Dombowski, Manager of the Environmental Management Unit at the Department of Environment, and Morgan Golden Ebanks, Policy Advisor for Resiliency in the Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency. The Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency and our departments, the Department of Environment, Hazard Management, and National Weather Service have been working very hard to develop the draft policy that is now out for public consultation. This policy is the product of months of teamwork and shareholder feedback. Our goal today is to provide you with an overview of the policy's vision, goals, and objectives. If you think you have questions, please send them to us at climate gov.ky. So why do we need a national climate change policy? Our climate is changing and it is changing fast. What this means is that we are and will continue to experience weather conditions and extreme events that we are not used to and are not prepared for. These changes to our climate are creating challenges that put many of us at risk. For example, we are already experiencing severe flooding in some areas, warmer sea and air temperatures, and impacts on our natural environment, such as our coral reefs. Our climate is expected to continue to change, and this means that our communities, economy, and ecosystems need to be prepared. We need to take actions that build resiliency and adaptability. The reality is that human health and well being in the Cayman Islands depends on actions we take today. Delaying action means greater challenges, costs, and hardship later on. The general public shares these sentiments. According to a survey we did last May, June, about 81% of over 1,000 respondents were extremely concerned about how climate change would impact them. Almost half, 48%, thought government is primarily responsible for taking action. 94% said they would definitely or probably change how they live to reduce the effects of climate change. We are now going to watch a short video that explains these issues. Since the Industrial Revolution, the Earth's surface has been warming at a rate not yet experienced in human history. Temperatures are rising quickly from an increased concentration of greenhouse gases that trap heat in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is the gas of most concern, and this is released from many activities, such as the burning of oil and gas to produce energy, or when forests are cleared and the soil is disturbed. Both the land and the ocean naturally absorb carbon dioxide but they can't handle the excess amounts that are building up in our atmosphere. The Cayman Islands may be small, but did you know that we are one of the highest emitters of greenhouse gases in the Caribbean? As more of our habitats are harmed by human activity, even less carbon dioxide is able to be absorbed. A warmer atmosphere and ocean is causing major shifts in local climates. The impacts of these changes are being felt around the globe, and that includes right here in the Cayman Islands. We are experiencing warmer days and nights, and fewer but more intense rainfall events. Coupled with intensified storms and rising seas, we are up against some serious challenges. We need to figure out ways to safeguard our home against the impacts of climate change while reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Some of these solutions lie in building adaptability and resiliency into our everyday life so we can be prepared to meet these challenges. Our vision is for a climate resilient Cayman Islands that promotes and sustains vibrant communities, a thriving natural environment, and a robust economy where people can live their best lives now 
and for future generations. So the benefits of the climate change policy are therefore clear. The policy has many benefits, but to name just a few, it establishes the what, the heart of the issue and approaches that we believe should be taken. It is a starting point from which government, businesses and households can understand the impacts of climate change and base decisions through a climate resiliency lens. The policy recognizes climate change as a national security issue, particularly its relationship between food, water, and energy, and climate migration and climate refugees. The policy also provides an, an opportunity to shape what we need to do now in terms of resiliency and where we desire to be in 20 years. It addresses impacts on our economy, impacts that could affect many people and their livelihoods. But where did this all begin? How did the policy come about? Some of you may recall or may even have participated in developing the draft 2011 climate change policy, which remained in draft. This policy is an update to that policy. Some of the recommendations outlined in the 2011 draft policy have since been achieved, such as the adoption of the national energy policy and the passage of the National Conservation Act 2013. However, much time has passed and we live in a rapidly evolving world. So updates were needed to account for new insights and circumstances. These came in the form of a climate change risk assessment funded through the governor's office in 2021-2022. You can learn more about this assessment at www.gov.ky forward slash sustainability forward slash climate change policy. It's important that we highlight some of the findings of the risk assessment because these findings informed many of the key actions outlined in the policy, ensuring their relevancy to our current and future needs. 11 sectors were identified to be at risk from climate related impacts, which you can see here. There were 50 risks in total with 18 being severe to our economy, society, habitats, and biodiversity, with another 16 moderate risks, though, less, though no less important. Just to give you some examples, one severe risk is damage and inundation to the sewage system and release of, of wastewater. Another is the decline in natural assets that underpin tourism. I encourage you to check out these risks in much more detail. So with this understanding and information, uh, the policy seeks to create a climate resilient Cayman Islands that promotes and sustains vibrant communities, a thriving natural environment, and a robust economy where people can live their best lives now and for future generations. So the image here on the screen is the policy framework. So it's basically the structure of the policy. So at the top, we have our vision. And then below that, we have our three goals. The first goal being to reduce Cayman's vulnerability and enhance our resiliency to climate change. The second goal is to promote sustainable, low or zero carbon economic activity. And the third goal is to establish a governance framework for climate action, which is future focused, fair to all, accountable and transparent. And then below that, we have our guiding principles. So tools to make uh, the strategies happen. So there are five policy tools that are embedded within the language of the strategies and these tools um, they ensure that the intent and the method of action for the strategies are clear. The first tool is to lead by example, and this tool speaks to government leading the way on different initiatives. The second policy tool is regulate. So this could perhaps involve um, looking at current laws and regulations and revising them or updating them where necessary, or even creating new ones. The third policy tool is tax and subsidize. 
So this policy tool really speaks to incentivizing um, decisions that build resiliency. The fourth policy tool is invest. So this can include things like government investing in research projects and different um, programs that bring us closer to achieving the goals of the policy. And last but definitely not least, we have inform and educate. So this can include um, education camp, public education campaigns, uh, incorporating climate topics into the school curriculum, and so on. So as you will see in the policy document, um, there are seven policy objectives, and that's where the strategies live. And so before we uh, before we go over the different policy objectives and give some examples of those strategies, we do want to highlight a few key points about the strategies. So first off, um, the strategies are what we want to accomplish. So when someone asks how these strategies will be accomplished, they're really asking for the finer details of things, what types of projects will be needed, when they will be launched, how much they will cost, and who's responsible for actioning them. While we have thought about these things as we've uh, come up with the strategies, all of those details are fleshed out in an implementation plan. That's the how. And this is being worked on, but it will come at a, a later date. Additionally, we have started thinking about the time frame in which we want to initiate action on these strategies, and that's also in the policy. So you'll see that the strategies are grouped by three time frames: 2023 to 2025, 2025 to 2030, and 2030 to 2040. The next thing to, to highlight here is that we intend to do reviews of the policy every five years. So this is really important so that we can assess our progress and also see if there's any new circumstances or priorities uh, that we need to address. And finally, we understand that as you review the policy and all the strategies, there's a lot of work that needs to get done. The good thing is, is that there's a lot of work that's already in progress. So for example, um, hazard management for the Cayman Islands. They're working on a flood sensor network, uh, a pilot program. And this would address things like severe flooding in different neighborhoods. The Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency has a tree planting initiative, which could really streamline well with um, programs that seek to address heat related issues in urban environments. So as I had noted earlier, um, we had our vision, then we had our goals, and then we had the seven policy objectives, and that's where all the strategies are. So the first policy objective is interwoven equity. And this area focuses on ensuring that our vulnerable groups have the tools and support to sufficiently adapt. Of course, climate change is and will continue to impact everyone, but certain groups, um, may be more likely to experience the negative impacts of a particular hazard. It really depends on uh, circumstance. So it's really important that we have a detailed understanding of and provide support to these vulnerable groups through effective emergency plans, appropriate financial and educational resources, improved health care, and opportunities to strengthen relationships and build self-efficacy. So moving forward, we're going to give one or two examples of strategy, strategies in each area. So for example, for interwoven equity, one strategy is to develop emergency management and evacuation strategies that prioritize vulnerable populations. So perhaps you may think um, elderly persons or persons with disabilities. Another strategy is to encourage more in-district workshops and networking opportunities to build individual and household capacities and strengthen relationships amongst community members. Okay. The second out of the seven pol policy areas is robust econ economy. Our economy is a central part of this discussion as everyone needs to make a living and relies on different products and services. Therefore, this area focuses on building a resilient economy that not only responds to risks, but takes advantage of opportunities that improve lives. 
We are all well aware that our world is changing rapidly in, re in many respects, and especially in regards to climate. Exis existing sectors will need to incorporate responses to climate risks in their short and long-term plans and adapt in order to sustain themselves. New and diverse modes of production, new sectors will need to emerge to meet the country's changing needs. Very important to, sorry, it's very important to consider here is the growing scale and cost of climate impacts as the, as the population increases. One strategy from the robust economy section is identify existing sectors in terminal decline due to long-term climatic changes and foster new opportunities in sectors that prioritize innovative and sustainable economic diversification and provide access to financial and technical resources for small and medium-sized enterprises. Another strategy is diversify production towards more climate resilient and resource efficient crops and livestock to enhance food security and reduce biodiversity impacts and economic losses. The third policy area is livable build environment. When we say environment, we don't only mean the plants and animals and all the beauty we find in nature, but we are, but we are also talking about the spaces and structures that humans have created. Improving components of our build environment of our built environment, like our homes and properties, to promote sustain sustainability, safety, and productive and productivity in daily life is essential for overall well-being. We need to bring together pieces of the built and natural environment in our analysis when trying to understand hazards and make decisions about how to protect people. Many strategies seek to address just this. For example, when thinking about how rainfall events are becoming more intense, one strategy is to increase investment in regional and site-specific storm water management programs and flood control methods, including soil and substrate surveys, to gain a better understanding of drainage and water conveyance mechanisms. Another strategy is complete necessary multi-hazard risk mapping to identify high-risk areas. And, re and reform the National Development Plan and Development and Planning Act and regulations to include appropriate development controls or design standards for these areas. Thank you very much, Kerry. So the fourth policy objective out of seven is the healthy and resilient communities. So this area really hones in on the health and safety implications on people from hazards, like higher temperatures and flooding so this is a, this area is obviously very important uh, to my team's work here at Hazard Management Cayman Islands. We need to provide people with the necessary information and tools to act, allowing individuals and their households to reduce their exposure and lowering the chances that they can be harmed by hazards. So the public and private sectors can also take actions that prevent pollution, use the protective benefits of nature, and improve emergency preparedness and response. So it's really important that we pay special attention to the health effects of climate change on our vulnerable groups. A strategy in this section is to develop comprehensive legislation and regulations for the control and pollution of air, water, and land pollution, including measurable standards that can guide development and public health. And another strategy is to retrofit existing shelters and ensure that new shelters are designed for multi-use purposes and for passive survivability to withstand even category five hurricanes and facilitate post-disaster recovery. Okay, I hope I'm not losing you here, anybody here at this point, but um, I know we're covering kind of a lot. We're on uh, the fifth policy uh, objective out of seven resilient infrastructure networks. So this part of the policy is perhaps really interesting to some people because it addresses the services and infrastructure that we all use every day, things like electricity and even flushing the bathroom. So these are for the most part in interconnected. And if one service goes down, others are likely to go down too. 
This policy area tries to be proactive by highlighting strategies that build resiliency in our infrastructure networks to mitigate losses and damages that could disrupt services and expose people to new or worsening hazards. Some strategies are undertake a feasibility analysis for the expansion of centralized sewage systems for the islands, considering whether decentralized operations are appropriate for resiliency, and also incentivize the diversification and investment in energy systems to include innovative renewable alternatives, such as solar powered desalination technology, decentralized microgrids, and uh, all underpinned by a regulatory framework with oversight from Offreg to encourage innovation. Thanks, Simon. The sixth policy objective is harmony with nature. The strategies in this area are important because while climate change is recognized as a key threat to nature or biodiversity, that's the diversity of life on the planet, Biodiversity helps us to mitigate our contributions to climate change and adapt to its impacts. Biodiversity and climate change are interdependent processes, and the biodiversity and climate change crises are interconnected and cannot be resolved separately. Worldwide, natural ecosystems absorb about half of CO2 emissions generated by human activities each year. And healthy ecosystems have a buffer effect on climate and help to reduce our exposure to the risks and impacts of extreme events such as storms, hurricanes, and floods. Nature-based solutions is a concept that promotes solutions to these challenges which are provided by nature. They are widely recognized as being more cost efficient than technological or infrastructure investments to tackle climate change. In Cayman, our mangrove and dry forests, as well as seagrass beds, capture and store a significant amount of carbon, not only in the biomass of the plants, but also in the soil and sediments present in these natural ecosystems. Along with our coral reefs and beaches, mangroves and shallow seagrass beds help to dissipate wave energy associated with storms and hurricanes. Ensuring that our natural spaces are abundant, healthy, and intact preserves quality of life for our people and their opportunities to flourish in various sectors of the economy. This work is, our, is central to the work of the Department of Environment and the National Conservation Council. So the policy seeks to sustain the benefits of nature through measures like the establishment of protected areas, responsible natural resource management, use of nature-based solutions, conservation plans, public education, and continued research and monitoring. Two examples of strategies are to update the Coastal Works Policy to include recommendations from the Beach Erosion Committee and other agencies evaluating comprehensive coastal zone management. And to integrate content on the value of natural systems for climate resiliency into public education campaigns. We are at the final policy objective integration and coordination. This is an important and somewhat unique area of the policy because as climate change will affect almost every aspect of our economy and society, it really highlights the need to integrate and coordinate actions across ver various entities within the public and private sectors. As you may have noticed, the policy areas we discuss are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They overlap in many respects. Many of the strategies will require a joint effort across two or three ministries, for example, or collaborations between government and a private company. Everyone has a vital role to play in helping our country become more resilient. The strategies in this area attempt to cover this ground as it relates to climate change. For example, one strategy is to establish a national climate resiliency framework and scorecard to be used by all government ministries to assess existing and new public policies and plans against adaptation and mitigation targets and indicators. And finally, evaluate the impact of population growth, both current and projected, on key public services and infrastructure systems like water, food, and energy that are also vulnerable to climate impacts.
Thanks very much, Loren, Simon, Carrie, and Morgan. That was a lot to go through, but I think everyone viewing this presentation has a much better understanding of the draft policy now. So what's next? Well, right now, we're in the public consultation period, which runs until the 30th of June. So please get all your feedback into us by then. We are hoping that the final policy will be approved and officially adopted as our national climate change policy in July. Once approved, we will be going right into planning implementation, which will outline how we plan to action the policy. So tell us your thoughts. And if you want to learn more about the climate change policy, please download it at www.gov.gov excuse me, www.gov.ky forward slash climate change policy. And as I mentioned before, your feedback is needed by the 30th of June. You can send us your feedback on the draft policy through the digital survey or by emailing climate at gov.ky. We want to thank everybody who is watching this presentation today. We have now done seven public meetings across all three islands over the past few weeks and have answered a variety of different questions from the community. But let's review some of the questions that we've received so far. So, Carrie, how about fielding the first one? What changes have we observed and what evidence do we have, such as sea level rise or air and sea temperature? Um, okay. So concerning temperatures and, um, and rainfall, which uh, a statement was mentioned in the video saying um, that we're experiencing um, uh, warmer, warmer daytime temperatures and warmer nighttime temperatures. Um, so basically, um, we have been noticing in the next, in, in the last, in the past 30 years that yeah, our max temperatures and our minimum temperatures have been increasing. So um, even today, We've noticed that uh, our temperature today was um, our max temperature has reached 33.9, um, I think it is. And while our record for today um, was actually 33.1, like in the past. So we, we've noticed even just today, we've had an increase of 0.8 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, uh, additional to that for rainfall, um, for the first two months, January and February, we experienced um, the Oh, sorry. So um, uh, what we're experiencing for rainfall now is that uh, we're having less rainfall events, but um, these rainfall events, rainfall events being more intense. So uh, even this year for January and February, we had on um, rainfall totals that were below the 30 year average. Yet on March, which is our driest month, we experienced one event that cre that ga that gave us a um a rainfall total that was greater than the the normal um climatological value for March. So even so, just the start of the year, we're seeing um the impacts of um this climate change affecting um affecting our islands right now. Thanks very much, Carrie. And I guess as a follow-up in terms of the, the temperatures, what's also important is that feel-like temperature, isn't it? That that humidex. Yes, yes. So um, the real feel, um, we're currently forecasting around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's mostly due to, yes, the high temperatures, but in combination with um, high humidity. And we are in, we are experiencing higher humidities right now, just being that we're in the um, in the wet season. So yes, so even though you have the natural increase in humidity from the season, it's coupled with the higher temperatures too. So yes, people are going to be experiencing those hundred plus degrees Fahrenheit, just the real feel. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thanks very much. And I guess that blends towards what Morgan was talking about in terms of the health implications of climate change and heat stress, particularly on our vulnerable populations, such as the, the el elderly um, or those that may suffer um, worse off as a result of uh, those higher humidity temperature and temperature combinations. So thanks very much, Perry. So Simon, how about taking the next one? 
What is hazard management doing to progress the understanding of risk and vulnerability so that we can plan accordingly for climate change? Thanks for the question, uh, Lisa. From our perspective, understanding risk and vulnerability is, is, is almost a sort of baseline of where we start because we really don't know what to prepare for, what to adapt to, um, adapt to mitigate against, or even what we could be having to recover from unless we really know what our risk is. So for example, we do have evacuation, um, the ability to issue evacuation orders in our legislation, but we've always been a bit hampered by the fact that we, we don't really have a clear idea of, of what the impacts are, even for hurricanes as they come towards us. While we might have an understanding of their the wind, um, you know, we, we're working now much more to understand how high the sea is going to rise um, as a storm is approaching us. For instance, the storm surge, the wave impacts. Um, looking back at Ivan, you know, we had two people die, 400 people were injured, $2.8 billion worth of damage. You know, over 10% of our population were homeless. Another 10 to 15% of the population left in the, in the few weeks after the event. So if we can actually get a really good handle and understanding of you know, just how high the sea is going to come up, then maybe we can start building in a way, especially our critical infrastructure, things like our shelters um, and our hospitals, you know, out of harm's way. And we do know that the sea is coming up. There's been estimates that it's coming up about a foot in the next 30 years. So we feel it's important to be anticipating that so you know we can uh, keep people safe so it's not just this the waves and the surge though you know we're very happy that the the premier managed to appeal to the hurricane committee recently and they've agreed to prioritize the cayman islands because we're just seven and a half feet above sea level here in grand cayman so they actually agreed that once the work is completed in bahamas that we are next. It's probably going to take about a year or a year and a half because they're running over a hundred thousand different scenarios of hurricanes of different size of uh, wind field, angle of approach, forward speed, wind velocity. Um, but they've agreed to to run this model for us next, so we're going to get a better idea of just what the risks we face. You know, we need this hard science and hard data to support real decision making, and hopefully, it will influence policy in terms of the way we plan and build as i spoke about and it also includes the wave impacts but another strand of our work is also looking at this issue of chronic flooding so we have our mitigation specialist mr mark codling who's um, working right now on uh, rolling out a internet of things flood sensor project so some of the hardest hit areas uh, communities we're going to be putting in these sensors so we start to get a picture of what's happening, especially on these high tides and perigean tides, you know, where places are already seeing the water coming over the, uh, the roads and the, and the, and the drains. Uh, and so if we're expecting another foot, just what are the implications? So we want to start being able to inform the public even prior to a, a flood event, you know, if they're likely to be impacted. So all this work is, is very critical to our role and it has a management, um, particularly for hurricanes, but also there are implications for earthquakes. I mean, we saw after the 7.7 .7 magnitude event in January 2020, you know, uh, we, we saw 53 sinkholes, including four in our government parking lot here in the government building and, and one in the hospital parking lot. That's our critical infrastructure. So if the ground's going to be more moist and, and, and um, you know, there's a chance of additional liquefaction, um, so all these elements have to be studied and understood. And I think, Lisa, you spoke about it earlier on, you know, the implications are hydrology, um, you know, if, if the ground is got additional water in it, uh, you know, the rise of the groundwater, um, it doesn't drain away as much. So we see more mosquitoes and things like that. So we need to be looking at all these elements, planning ahead, and hopefully building resilience and capacity so the Cayman Islands continues to thrive and, and is a success into the future, uh, especially for our young people who I know are very worried about this.
Thanks, Simon, for that very comprehensive answer. It long, sounds so. like, <laughs> no, that's, that's perfect. That, that's mm. a lot of information that, that has been shared. And it sounds like the work of hazard management already touches on several of the policy objective areas, um, th some of the areas that you presented, as well as some of the areas that Kerry presented on, and that we need to complete that work of the multi-risk, uh, multi-hazard uh, risk assessments and to ensure that our laws and uh, policies are all intertwined and aligned with this uh, climate change policy. So thank you very much for that. Just now, quickly Lorraine, add, uh, just before Lorraine, I just hope that at some point has a management could even possibly, you know, once we have this data, be involved in maybe the planning and pro uh, development process. It's possible government will want us to do that once we have that data to support the decision making about building resilience and, and lowering the risk for our people. Apologies, Absolutely. Lorraine. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Simon. And yes, we, we will be having discussions with the um, planning entities and uh, those in government as well as non-government. So stay tuned for that. So, Loren, last but certainly not least, where do you think the greatest opportunities are to implement nature-based solutions? And what are some examples? Our mangrove wetlands are one of the best opportunities for nature-based solutions. Um, they provide flood mitigation, water purification, and biodiversity conservation. Um, so that's why a strategy in the climate change policy is to develop and implement a plan to protect the central, central mangrove wetland. Sustainable urban drainage systems are another great example of nature-based solutions. These are also called SUDs. So SUDs are drainage solutions that are different to what we normally do, which is directly channel surface water through pipes and deep wells. SUDs include things like having rainwater gardens or swales or retaining mangroves. And by mimicking natural drainage regimes, SUDs can reduce surface water flooding and improve water quality and also enhance the amenity and the biodiversity value of our urban environment. Thanks, Loren. And what would you say are some of the obstacles or barriers for implementing some of these solutions? Um, the space. I mean, we're a small island, so um, we uh, we don't have very much space, um, and a lot of there's a lot of different competing priorities when it comes to how we use our land. Um, but we can have win wins when we implement nature based solutions. They can address some of these issues that are um, really going to affect our um, built environment while still enhancing biodiversity. Um, and the other uh, barrier is um, people become entrenched in the way that things are done and um, are often resistant to change, which is why some of the policy levers that we talked about earlier, like government leading by example and investing in developing you know, new technologies, new way of doing things, and um, can really help to elevate us and to um, help us adapt to climate change better. Fantastic. And on that note, I think we've addressed many different questions that came in from the public uh, so far in our consultations. And I'd like to thank everybody out there for listening and viewing the presentation. And again, if you have any questions or comments, please email us at climate at gov.ky. And if you'd like to feed back to us through the feedback form mentioned earlier, go to gov.ky forward slash climate change policy and click on the link. Thanks very much, everybody. Looking forward to hearing all of your great suggestions and feedback.